The Psychedelic Integration Coach and Psychedelia Psychedelic Experience Integration are a collective of professionals and peers interested in the potential psychological and spiritual healing properties of psychedelics. Our events are intended for the purpose of educating about mindful and safe integration of entheogenic experiences, offering emotional support, and creating meaningful connections between community members. Find more information at www.psychedelicintegrationcoach.com slash events, and may you live that psychedelic feeling. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for being so patient. Traffic has been a, a B-I, T-I-C-H, today more than usual. Um, I'm still missing a couple of people, but we'll get started. Thanks for coming. My name is Cherie Malcolm Gadassi. I am a psychedelic integration coach and the founder and director of Psychedelia, Psychedelic Experience Integration in LA. Uh, we have been uh, holding meetings and uh, events and workshops and educational courses um, for a couple of years, full, safe um, uh, engagement with psychedelic substances. Hello, please come in. Um, and now uh, we have a great community going. Um, so happy. To see a lot of new faces here today, as usual, it's uh, it's really awesome because it means that our community is growing. So, and of course, thank you to our core members that keep showing up week after week, event after event. Um, I'd like everyone uh, to encourage everyone to turn to the person to your right and your left and say hello, introduce yourselves, because we're all about community connection. I'll say hello to you. What is it? I'm Sarah. I'm Sarah. What's your name? Zahara. Oh, okay. I have to like sit back. Awesome. Coffee and drinks later. It'll be a um, little coffee. So uh, we're excited tonight to host dear, dear friend and teacher um, John DeRosa. Uh, he is uh, joining us for actually the third time, I think, right? This really? is our third hobby event that we've had in the last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we've always been a great success. Mm -hmm. We've had some, have some people here who attended the previous events. Um, John and I have known each other, I think, for a couple of years, maybe a little bit more, years. right? Uh, through uh, sacred ceremonies. Uh, John is a shamanic practitioner. Um, that studied in uh, Peru for under the guidance of another facilitator that we have here called Reguero, Javier Reguero, who is a fantastic uh, ayahuasca hero uh, in Peru. And uh, John came here today as an, well, John has many different expertise. One of them is that he's a somatic uh, ex experiencing practitioner and works with people one-on-one -on -one to, um, to, if you can explain it in two sentences. Uh, pinpoint trauma in the body and work to release that stuck energy, that stuck trauma. That, uh, especially for psychedelic work, uh, as some of you or all of you probably know, there's a lot of energy release that happens or traumatic energy release uh, that can happen during these experiences and in the uh, <coughs> period that comes after the ceremony. So getting some good body work like somatic experiencing is a great way to reconnect with that uh, trapped energy and allow it to come out to deepen the healing. Um, so John does that as well. He is the owner of Hana Pacha, which is a specialty um, boutique. Would you call it a sure. boutique of, uh, of uh, everything shamanic? So he's an expert on on Hape, which is uh, our topic of tonight, um, he uh, particularly <coughs> imports uh, different blends from the Amazon. He makes these beautiful uh, pipes, kuripes, and tepis, which he, he has brought some here uh, to share with you all. And uh, he will uh, guide us today through the, the different aspects of engaging with Hape medicine, uh, which uh, will probably include some history, background of of uh, the medicine, how it's used traditionally, how some of us use it here in the West, how it's used in the context of ceremony, what kind of healing this medicine can introduce, and also how it can be used in integration work. Um, so this will be a 
lecture style, but also maybe semi-interactive, right? There will be definitely be time for questions. There'll definitely be time for questions for the end, and I may actually have questions for you guys to participate during, so don't be shy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Don't be shy and take some notes if you want. And uh, afterwards, uh, after the, the workshop, we'll culminate. You guys can have a look at John's beautiful items, and there will be an opportunity to purchase some. He didn't bring too much with him today, but. I didn't want to be like completely overwhelming because I know that time is a little limited here. So yeah, there's, a some, lot of stuff. Yeah, there's some things here. Um, there's postcards which have my website and also information. So I ship every day and in LA. It usually arrives within a day. So if there's something that you'd like and you don't get a chance to pick up, email me, visit the site, and we'll, you know, we'll make, make sure it gets taken care of. So. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yes, one more thing, our legal disclaimer. Um, as we all know, we are living in interesting times, a time when uh, these uh, psychedelic substances and a lot of these medicines are being proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that uh, they are extremely beneficial for psychological as well as physical healing. Uh, however, these medicines, most of them, not the happy that we're going to talk about with tonight, but um, other psychedelics are prohibited and they're <laughs> scheduled as uh, scheduled one substances, meaning it. So um, even though this is the topic of our conversation, please be mindful that we're not here to uh, to gather information on where to purchase illegal substances or how to partake in illegal ceremonies. Um, this is this class is strictly for educational purposes, for harm reduction purposes, and for community connecting. Okay, so thanks for respecting our rules. And without further ado, I do job. Hey guys. How are you? Okay. Uh, thanks for coming. It's amazing to see all of you. Uh, I'm going to... Sheree gave a bit of a brief introduction for myself, so I won't take too much time with that. Um, but, you know, I'll just reiterate that I've been working in uh, shamanic healing, curanderismo, uh, with plant medicines for maybe like the past five years, um, studying both here and in Peru with my teachers. Um, I, uh, that's basically what introduced me to working with Rape, or Rape, uh, and in my work in that realm, in all things shamanic, um, I started to notice uh, a lot about how trauma is stored in the body, um, you know, why it's hard for us to let it go. And I started to see the transformations that happen in people who are working with plant medicines and working in that type of healing. And it led me to, in the past couple of years, working in the somatic healing as well. Because I started to see very quickly uh, the correlations in how how we do the work in shamanic healing, how it's very similar um, and how it works with trauma release and somatic uh, healing and also PNE, which is part of the other uh, discipline I study, which is short for psychoneuroenergetics. So the work that I do now, even, and the reason I bring it up, I should say, is that some of what I'm going to talk about tonight is totally factual, um, as much as it possibly can be with Rape, because there's so little actually written. Uh, some of it's, uh, you know, handed down from tradition. Some of it's been told to me by colleagues of mine who actually work directly with the tribes. And some of it is uh, things that I've picked up over the course of time working on it personally. Um, My approach does involve a lot of the traditional elements. I also combine a bit of my background with the somatic as well, because I think that both are very important here. So I'm going to give you a little bit of like my own impressions on this medicine, how to do this work, and know that I don't consider myself an authority. Um, 
this is a learning experience for everyone. I invite you to take in what I have to say and uh, use what you can and see what feels right for you and maybe use it to, you know, explore and, and I want to start by, <coughs> first let me just ask how many people you've actually worked with Rappé or had. Okay, so maybe three, mostly three quarters. Okay, good. Um, so does anyone know what it is exactly, physically, probably? <laughs> yeah, it's 100% um, tobacco and ketchup, and uh, with uh, different types of herbs and um, like, you know, um, branches or like sure. the bark from a tree. Okay. It all depends on what kind of plant it is. Okay, good. So rape or hape, depending on if you're pronouncing it in Portuguese, so, uh, is a blend of, at its, at, its, at its most basic, it would be mapacho, which is a, a very strong jungle tobacco. Nicotiana rustica. I always get that a little wrong. Um, it is a blend of that mixed with ashes, specific types of ashes from particular types of trees. The ashes uh, give a medicinal property, but also alkalize it so that it can actually be absorbed. That is rapé at its most basic. Um, in addition to that, there may be you know medicinal herbs and plants added to it to produce a desired uh, quality, whether it be phys for a physical healing or a energetic property or a emotional healing. Um, it's important to um, it's important to state that mapacho is considered the mother or the father, depending on how you uh, engender it. Is a mother or father of all plants in um, shamanic healing. So it's a very uh, sacred and special uh, medicinal plant. In much the same way that for Native Americans here in the north, uh, tobacco would be a sacred, uh, a sacred plant, a sacred uh, offering, something that would carry intention when it's smoked and blown and offered, something that you can infuse with prayer. So for there's some, some correlations there between how it's viewed in the uh, Amazonian cultures as well. Mapacho is uh, it's generally said to be about 10 or 10, sometimes 20, but I would say about 10 times stronger than American tobacco in terms of its potency. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about tobacco in relation to how it's in our pay, that's what we're talking about. Uh, uh, it would be, raw pay would, you know, generally be administered with a carupe, which is a like a Y-shaped pipe. There's some on the table there, and it would be a self-administration. <laughs> Maybe we can grab one so you can yeah, demonstrate. Let's try it on mine, please. So the caripe is the traditional method, and this is made of stone. But in the Amazon, you'd see these made of bone. You'd see them made of bamboo. Um, now you can see that they're carving them out of palo sangre and things, so it's getting really fancy. Um, these are uh, a te this is called a tepi. So this is would be something where if someone was administering a pay to you, it would be like this. So the same thing, bamboo, bone, wood, stone. Um, you know, all tribes have their own process of rape creation, there's masters in, 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 in each tribe, and most of them keep uh, 
the recipes and the process fairly secret. The one thing I do want to introduce before I go into the more like physical act of the making is I want to just like introduce the idea of intention as I was referring to how Native Americans might use tobacco as a sacred offering, as a something to carry a prayer to the heavens, something uh, to amplify uh, an intention. And I want you to just keep in the back of your mind as we have the talk, because while, while, the, while Rape is uh, very powerful in itself as a plant medicine, um, I find myself saying this over and over again when people come to me for advice on how to work with it. Say, so, you know, I feel this way, I feel this way, let's not doing this, let's not doing this. And time and time again, I find myself saying, you know, it, it's mostly about intention. So we're going to get really farther into that as we talk about personal usage and things like that. But just as I talk about it from the start, you know, keep it in mind. The origins of how it came to be vary as they do tend to with plant medicines, and they vary from tribe to tribe in terms of what stories were you know, passed down. We don't really know. It's kind of, it's kind of uh, the mystery of it. It's kind of interesting. I did, I read a, uh, a really, really wonderful paper by Simon Scott, who's very well respected in, in this world of rapé and, and uh, shamanic uh, plant medicine. And he was relating a story um, about um, his time with the Shawandawa tribe. And he was told the, the story of the Black Earth, which is basically that back in the, going back, 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 the, uh, the Shawandawa used to clear a, floor, clear a jungle area for, to make fertile for their gardening and for growing food. And so they'd have to burn you know, the trees in this one particular area, just black in the whole area. And what they would do with the ashes that were produced from this, we'd put them back into the earth and create this like wonderfully fertile ground. And they'd actually have a grid pattern. They grid it off and they put like holes and then they put the ash in there. And so while young men of the tribe were busy doing this manual labor, the, the elders, the shaman, the paies, as they call them, were working with the ashes and experimenting with the ashes and seeing how to mix it with the mapacho. In the meantime, mapacho uh, loves this fertile ground, so the mapacho is growing in all of these ashes. And that is how it was related to him in terms of how the different varieties and different methods kind of started to come to be. <coughs> In terms of the ashes, I've seen somewhere around like maybe 15 different types of ashes used with the mapacho. I don't know if that's like a, that's a number that I've heard from a few different people. Ironically, that's about the number of um, tribes that there are in that basin region, the Yurima Valley. Uh, and it's said that, you know, particular tribes favor particular types of ashes in their traditional blends. Um, you know, uh, that the Yawanawa preferred the Sunu tree the ashes or the, uh, the katakina, I prefer the muriatero. I see it change. I don't. I, I see it not necessarily sticking to that, and I don't know if it's because now that there's a bit of more of a market where these rapes are making them out of the jungle, um, or if it's just innovation in terms of um, what's available. But I've seen uh, rapes from the Kuntanawa tribe using sunu. The Kuntana tribe using Kumaru. Um, so 
again, they're not hard and fast rules, but the idea with the ashes is that, you know, think about, think about the bark of the tree, think about the trees in the Amazon, these massive trees absorbing the energy from the rainforest, absorbing, you know, the energy from the sun for hundreds and hundreds of years, and then being, uh, being borrowed, they're very, uh, respectful in how they harvest it. It made it to a fine, fine powder. And so we're kind of like uh, harnessing all of that energy, harnessing all of that uh, beauty and that healing power that it's been absorbing for all of that time. And you know, there's so much more in terms of what goes into it. Um, but I don't want to let, I don't want to say too, too long on the the actual process, I will say that there's sometimes a fermentation process involved with the uh, actual mapacho. Um, if you are, are a rapé user who's had some very funky rapé, mm -hmm. you may have had some uh, a ferment, some, some type of a fermented mapacho. Uh, and once again, um, you know, the additives that can be used are many, um, almost any type of floral essence can be added. Um, tonka seeds, which are very sweet like vanilla, can be added. Uh, Obensana, which is a master teacher plant using dream work, can be added. And this is just some things that come to me off the top of my head. One of the rapes that we have in the back here, the Ahosacha. Ahosacha is a, a beautiful uh, healing plant from the Amazon that's actually a, a cleanser. Um, it's a bit garlicky, actually. And the hunters would use that about day before they went on the, uh, their hunt, um, partially because it would you know, mask the smell of the human body and keep them more stealthy. Um, or they would drink concoctions of the auto subject. Even to this day, uh, from my time that I spent there and I dieted that particular plant, I was told that newborn babies in the Amazon would be bathed the leaves of the Aosacha because it's believed to have such powerful uh, purification properties. So here's where the, um, the artistic elements come in in the Rape creation, which I'm seeing more and more. Um, in addition to the physical ingredients, there's prayer and intention. Um, not just anyone makes Rape, it's usually a chief or a son of a chieftain or someone higher up in the, in the community. Um, and from my friends that I have working down there with the tribes, they have related me stories of the famous Rappé makers right now. So there's, um, there's minor celebrities down there that are <coughs> creating some beautiful medicine. <coughs> so I want to also really quickly mention the rapes that I'm talking about today. They are um, of the non psychoactive variety. Um, psychoactive, I guess, is a little bit of, I'm not sure, Sheree, if that would be an accurate term, but what I'm talking about is uh, rapes that do not have a psychedelic effect on the brain. So. Um, there are ones that exist that contain Yopo, which is a very uh, DMT heavy containing seed that would provide almost like a, uh, a similar to an ayahuasca experience. <clears throat> Isn't it 5-MeO DMT in the Yopo? Yes. Yep. Uh, and there's a few other plants as well. But so. Um, while those exist, when I talk about raw pay today in a general sense, I'm not really referring to those. Um, those are, I consider to be a little bit of a different uh, category and would need to be treated with a little bit of a different approach, especially if used in conjunction with other plant medicines because there can be some reactions there. So we're talking about a basic uh, mapacho and ashes type of situation. So now that we've gotten the, a little bit of the, uh, 
the basic how to do it, how to make it out of the way. Why do you think, why would anybody do this? <laughs> I mean, anybody who's worked with it knows that it's uh, a little uncomfortable. It can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, what, are, what are some of the effects and the healing properties that you would think would come from working with this? It's a heart opener. It's a heart opener. What does that mean for you? Um, well, I usually go in it with an intention, yeah. and then um, I, I I clear whatever it is that's that's um, that's not clear for me, and then I create what it is that um, that you have me. Okay, good. I like it. And I like it most of all because you're actually being very engaging and, and you know, working with it. It's not just, oh, I do this and then this happens. It's you're actually meeting it, which is amazing. It's great. Greg? Helps clear stuck energy and emotions. Mm -hmm. Helps clear stuck energy and emotions. Good. So that's very, very grounding. Grounding. And it helps with, like, the mind-body connection. Good. Yes. Connects it to your higher self. Connects to higher it's self. Great. Can you like that one? Yeah. Um, I was going to say it amplifies my intuition. Mm -hmm. Good. But it quiets my mind. Quiets mm -hmm. the mind. Good. These are all correct. Um, and, you know, I'll just add, I'll just, the regular <coughs> is really going, it is the, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the remedies for plant medicine, whatever the, the, the medicine is, goes back to uh, cleansing. It's hard to say what all of the initial intentions were for these medicines because I believe it varies by the tribe, but you know, purging was probably pretty high up there with what it was created to do. If you think about tobacco, tobacco shaman, mapacho shaman, um, ingesting larger amounts of mapacho um, as part of a, a diet, as part of a, a dieta, um, cleansing and pulling out a lot of that, uh, not only the physical junk, uh, but the emotional as well. So, so it's meant to be a purgative? But I believe typically. I believe that at its core, much like ayahuasca, really, you know, if you think about ayahuasca, the some of the um, some of the most pure traditions of that really don't believe in the visions whatsoever in terms of you know having a, a having a, a reason. It's more about it could be completely a physical mm -hmm. cleanse. So again, that's a whole other you know, topic and debate. But my feeling is that um, physical cleansing was a very important reason that this medicine was first created and, and used. When you think about mapacho and the ash together, that's sort of the reaction that you get. <coughs> I believe, and again, it's really hard to say, but from what I've read and from what I've been told, a lot of the additions came a little bit later in terms of like the added ingredient specifically for joint pain, the added ingredient specifically for inflammatory. Um, but once again, you know, this varied by tribe. Um, this is where, you know, as we kind of slide into talking about how we in the 
this day and age in this place that we are working in, this is where we really want to once again revisit intention and think about uh, how these medicines are, are made. Because we, we've been talking about ingredients and focusing on that. Beyond the, you know, we ran through a few of the why would be useless. Um, there are so many other different reasons. You know, for physical, there's reasons in terms of like, uh, you know, stimulating the nervous system, increasing blood circulation. These are effects that then help conditions. If someone has a situation that that would help. In you know, in emotional sense, or we can say a psychological sense, is where I feel that the medicine is at its most useful, especially to Westerners, especially to the average person. And that's in the way that it actually brings things to the surface. Brings anxieties to the surface. It brings uh, fears, especially. I think that there's other types of um, you know there's other types of benefits, and it really depends on where what our personal intention is and where we're personally at. And you know, when we talk about like this young lady was saying that, you know, our connection to the higher self, it's like that's a wonderful intention. And in my experience that requires a lot of clarity and a lot of work to um, achieve that. And so, you know, we're all in a kind of different place where these medicines can be different things for each of us. And it's much the same with plant medicines in general that way. This is we work with plant medicines throughout our lives. The intentions change and also the effects that they have on us change as we change. So it's sometimes a little tricky for me to provide expert advice when people have certain questions about well, which one is right for me. And, and so it takes um, a lot of a, getting a sense of some, someone energetically, a lot of sense of what's really happening with someone. Because there's really not a out of the box solution in most cases in this world. There are medicines that may work um, for people dealing with certain things, uh, but I just say it to emphasize how important it is that we personalize this information and how we, we can take what we read that's out there as a nice starting point or as a guide and say, well, I read that this plant or this rapé is good for this one thing. But then let's see how it actually works with us. Let's see what we are finding. See if what we are connecting to it in that way. And perhaps it means something different for us in that time, in that moment that we're at. Um, okay. So, I like to talk, like, get really into all of this. This is, seems to be, when I, when I announced, or announced, when I put out there that we were doing this talk again, this is the second one we've done that's like this. The last one was about a year ago, a year and a half. And as I look back on it, a lot of people viewed that. And when I look back on it, I said, this is pretty good, but there's some things that I would have liked to um, go into a little bit more. And I put the call out to some people in my community and, 
and say, like, what are some of the questions that you have? And so much of it, um, so many people had so much of the, the same types of questions. So it's really good to see what's really um, on people's minds. The <clears throat> Before I go any farther, I want to say, am I? Sometimes I have the tendency to kind of like be a little all over. Am I? Am I kind of staying on a good uh, no, track? No, you're great. Well, does anyone have any particular questions about everything that was set up until this point? I, oh, I have a question. Sure, I'll get one. Um, a lot of the different plants that we use open up certain things inside you physically. There's a, there's a physical something that it does. Do you know what specifically uh, Napaco does? Um, I guess that was the question of biologically or if certain, it's, it's accessing certain receptors, mm. things like that. We see Mapacho is sort of an all powerful plant being the being at the top of the hierarchy of plant medicines. I think it's a powerful purgative on its physical level in terms of clearing. I think that it's been very astringent as well in terms of pulling out. I think that um, it's very much so an amplifier of intention. I don't know I can't say for sure specifically if, like for instance, I would say with Bobansana, where you know I know for a fact that Bobansana is this beautiful teacher plant that is used quite often in dream work, you know, exploring dreams, heart opening types of um, healing. I always see Mapacho as almost like, you know, uh, like a like the god or goddess of, of all others. So I don't know if it's if I have more of a, of a specific uh, superpower for that plan as much as, a, as what I was just related. Sure again. Okay. That is more quite a bit of a separating rape or rape from apatra, because the two seem to act differently. I know there's uh, in Hape, but it just has a different characteristic when it's applied. Mm -hmm. And it seems to give a big jolt to the nervous system, I think, physically. It's mm -hmm. the first thing, because it's right there. Everything goes through those membranes and before you know it. Well, the first time I had it, it felt like my head opened up like a satellite dish, and I could see the universe. I had to touch it. <laughs> that good. But you, Mapacho alone is like, like John said, it's the master teacher. In the Amazon, it's in higher status than anything, even ayahuasca. Where ayahuasca usually has a lot different of a meaning and context down in the jungle. It's more of a uh, diagnostic tool, mm -hmm. and a way for the shaman to be able to look into you, like his eyes turn into x rays. has a different vibe, a different characteristic. So Mapacho is the master teacher, and it's the emissary that introduces people to all the other plants. Mm -hmm. So it's your spokesperson. So I think that's a really good way to describe yeah. it, and not to cut you too short, but that's, did you have another well, one? I was just wondering if you, you mentioned Yopo and it, of the psychedelics, have you ever heard of Rupmansia or Datura being used? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, um. I've had some rapes of that nature in the Amazon. Um, not to the ex a lot of times they're, in my experience, and again, I'm not an expert, I don't know how many people are that are, that are Westerners, but um, in my experience, when a plant like that is added, it's, it's often added for really an energetic purpose, not necessarily because you're um, going to be uh, having a toy experience. It's kind of there as a, uh, 
in, a, in an energetic quality, in a, in a small enough concentration. I don't know very much about that particular uh, plant medicine, so I can't speak for sure. But I know that there are lattes I've seen recently that have salvia that would be a bit more of that type of property as well. Um, I don't work as much with, with that kind of thing. Awesome, thanks. Did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that in the Amazon, with my pasta, it's a cleanser and purifier. Yes. So when they are, the shamans are coming to each of us, they are cleansing and purifying our heart fields of um, any negative entity, any negative entity. I just wanted to say that. Okay, last one. <laughs> I was going to add to that. Like, so in me working with my teacher in African um, traditional religion, and and I won't speak for all, but and for voodoo, it is a cleanser mm -hmm. and a conductor. So. I uh, so what I really I really want to. This is sort of the, the really important stuff um, in terms of. How we work with it, how we work with Rape, those of us in this room and in this hemisphere. Um, you know, I'm always very careful because I have strong opinions about certain things and I want to make it clear that it's my opinion and that um, people may feel differently. You know, my feeling with Rape is that, much like other plant medicines, it's going to show us the door, it's going to sh maybe even open the door, but it really requires a lot on our behalf in terms of meeting and making things happen. Um, I get a lot of questions about, you know, what would be the best Rape for this if it's a physical ailment, sometimes it's pretty clear because you know there's antibacterials, there's anti-inflammatories. If it's a little more rooted in emotion, it's harder because we first have to, and this is where soma, som, my somatic comes in in how I work with this medicine as well. We all have an idea about what the root of our trauma is. Mm -hmm. We all have a thought or a story about it. And sometimes it's true, sometimes it's a little bit true, and sometimes it's not really true at all. And so much of so much of that so much of finding the root of what's happening has to do with body, sensations in the body. Because the body has an amazing memory, and it's a much more accurate memory than we have. So, my approach, uh, my approach to rape is to use a somatic approach, meaning start to notice what's happening in your body beforehand. <coughs> start to notice what's happening in your body as you work with it. Because whatever is happening is going to be emphasized, amplified, and brought to the surface. And we need to kind of let those things happen because any type of resistance, because we're like, no, that's not the thing, it's going to sort of put the brakes on it a little bit. Um, My feeling is that most of all, rapé is a medicine of connection. So what I mean by that is that it has the ability with our assistance to open up energetic portals in the body. It's not light stuff. It's, 
It's serious medicine. Um, as you know, you know, intention and setting is very important with all of these medicines, and Rape is no uh, ex uh, exclusion from that. And I'm very conservative about the way I treat Rape and the advice that I give because. Rapé has this reputation because it's a bit more of an accessible medicine. Most people are introduced to it by way of another plant medicine, a ceremony, and they have it. And it seems like I hear a lot, it's like, well, it's a good way to stay in touch with the plant medicines, like while I'm on its own. But it's very true. But it should also be treated kind of in that ceremonial way all, all of the time. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, psychologically speaking, it deals with fears. For myself, even as someone who's worked with it for years, that is like the thing that comes up. Anxieties. A very strong application is going to bring a lot of the shadow out. And here's where, you know, the way we work with it, really matters in how we can tie up what's happening. Because if we're kind of like, oh, you know, I have like 15 minutes before work, and, and you know, have these things stirred up, start to simmer to the surface, and we don't have either the time or the focus or the attention to work with them, we're going to really end up with a lot of like kind of garbage that's hanging out on the surface. And it's going to give us some anxi more anxiety. It's not really going to resolve anything. And what I also notice is that it leaves you a little bit hanging wide open, a little susceptible. Um, and once again, this is you know, personal thought, experience, and it could be very different for most people or some people. Um, Another question. Yeah. When you say work with them as the feelings come up, what does that look like? So, we have the tendency when we feel discomfort to want to get, get past it right away. We have the tendency maybe to want to put our mind on other things. We have the tendency to maybe just kind of keep our head down and just like wait for the storm to pass. I think a better solution if we're serious about wanting to, you know, have a practice and develop a relationship with the medicine, we kind of need to be willing to really sit with it, feel it, feel where it is. Mm -hmm. Give it the attention, see what comes up, see what the emotion comes up. It might be a memory that comes up. It might be an action that needs to be completed. If you go far enough into it, it might, it might throw up, it might purge, mm -hmm. it might be that. Um, it might be an emotion that's just really stewing. So, you know, that's kind of what I mean. Instead of just saying, like, you know, okay, well, the 15 minutes are up, the effects are kind of going away. It's like, I feel like, okay. Because that's, that's how we end up disassociating in the first place from the trauma that we have, is we don't really give it the attention it needs when it happens. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. And that's how we end up stuck with it somewhere in our body that doesn't want to go anywhere. So, yes. I also want to add to that um, that I think music plays a important role in that too. Music? Music that you choose to sure. to, uh, to play or to... Mm -hmm. During the... During. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good point. Um, yes. Um, Yes. 
Um, are there any circumstances in which you would suggest that like, on a particular day not to use the hepe if, let's say, you're feeling particularly anxious or you're going through a particular crisis or whatever because it does bring up stuff, and if you don't have the tools yeah. or the ability or the strength to deal with what comes up? Yeah. I, I, think, I think you need to be very kind to yourself first and foremost. Mm -hmm. I'm very much... Uh, I put myself through a lot of physical uh, distress in under the guise of healing, you know, over the years, and come out on the other end being like, well, yeah, I think I think that was for the best, but maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I put a lot of trauma in the body by healing the trauma. So I think that you know, being kind is important. I think that we need to be very careful with people who have had trauma and working with raw pay to heal the trauma, because mm -hmm. it's very delicate. It's very delicate with trauma, and we don't really find that trauma responds well to intensity. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't provide a safe place to, um, to release. Trauma is released, in my experience, when there's a safety and the comfort and the support so, you know, there's people I know who swear by combo, there's people who swear by a lot of the per more purgative. It's like, I think it works for some people. I think it's amazing. I've seen it do all of these medicines do miracles. We need to ask ourselves where we are in our lives and if we are feeling that that is the right approach. If I'm working with someone um, who has had trauma, especially early childhood trauma or different things, I, I, mean, I don't mix my practices, I'll say. I don't say, oh, we're here to do somatic, I'll do raw pay. I don't, I don't do any of that. And with raw pay, for me, it's purely relegated to a, a shamanic healing capacity. Um, it brings up another, like, really important topic, and that's um, administering to others. Um, traditionally, most tribes, Unikun especially, the Alanawa come to mind. The belief is, you know, when you're blowing rape into another person, there's an intense energy exchange. It's not just the person doing the blowing, it's the person, it's coming back the other way too. Um, The traditional belief is that you know you shouldn't be doing an administration on someone unless you've had a um, training from an elder, an apprenticeship in, in the rape, an apprenticeship with the mabacho. Um, my personal feeling is in line with that, although I'm a little more of the mind of if you've had, if you've developed the relationship with the rape for yourself over the course of time where you understand energetically how it's working. If you are have apprenticed in another healing capacity you know, as a shamanic facilitator and understand what it, how an energy exchange works, uh, ideally I think it's important to have completed plant diets of some type to understand energetically um, what's happening it's not just powder that's being blown. There's a whole world of uh, energetic exchange and also healing happening. I s I've seen it most evident. Um, well, I will say I think that if, if your partners, if you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, I feel like you already have an intimate energy exchange and that um, if you have a relationship that uh, makes that feel good to have that exchange as well with the is I've seen that be okay as well. The important thing is you know 
you want to really be careful. You want to ask yourself what kind of energy we're receiving. Not only as the person on the receiving end, the person who's actually doing the administration. Because you're going to pick something up. You know, there's a, I'm just looking at this line from this essay I read recently, or I found recently, and it was, uh, it's according to indigenous traditions, rape can both cure and cause disease. It's depending on the energy and the intention with which it's been exchanged. I think that, you know, I think that as times are changing and as, you know, even in the past 10 years, this medicine would not really be found up here at all. So there's things that I think need to adapt over time to just sort of change with the times, but I do think that in this capacity it's just quite important to be mindful of the exchanges that are happening if we choose to uh, have this medicine administered to us or give it to someone else. It's a little hard because I get a lot of emails from people saying, um, I was at this thing this weekend, and someone gave me raw pay, and now I feel X, Y, Z, and they blame it on the raw pay. What was in it? It's really hard to, to sit when someone has a, a, a very positive intention, and hard to say, you know, I want to share this with my friends, I want to share this with my loved one. You know, it's hard to say, you know what, it's just maybe um, build our relationship and uh, start to understand that energy and how it's working and how it how it's affecting how it can be affecting to you and also how it can be returned do you recommend working with one Admixture at a time or one plant at a time, yeah. and for how That's long? A good point. There's so many different varieties. I feel like each one is its own unique, its own unique medicine. It really is, and I suggest, in my experience, the best way to develop the relationship is to maybe try one, try two, see what feels. Mm -hmm like it resonates with you, and then work with it continuously for a period of time. Because it'll change. Just like all plant medicines, you will never have the same experience more than once, but what it will do over the course of time is provide like an overview of the energy of what it is. Like it's a personality. Mm -hmm. How much is too much? <coughs> Always say everyone knows that for themselves. It's it's usually pretty clear when it's becoming a habit for people. It is a very powerful tobacco. Tobacco is nicotine. So, you know that's another thing as we develop this relationship. Try and keep it and be realistic with yourselves in terms of Am I really doing this because I want to meditate, or do I like want? Is this the equivalent of you know, having a smoke right now? I don't see any. I don't see any problem with using it in a daily meditation in moderation. I go weeks at a time without touching it, and then maybe I'll go through a phase where for a week I'll be working with it. Dosage is really up to the person and up to the medicine. 
I have some articles that are I'd be happy to send that are useful for the very mo most basics like that. Um, in terms of my last thing, I'll just say some, and then I'll take some questions. Um, people have asked about risks. You know, once again, I think, you know, as far as I know, there hasn't been any conclusive real, real studies done that can say, you know, that this is causing this and this. I think, once again, you know, it doesn't care, Rapé doesn't carry the same dangers as smoking. Um, it's not going into the lungs. There's not, you know, in most cases it's completely organic. There's not kind of the additives and the chemicals that we're going to find in American cigarettes. It doesn't mean that you should do handfuls of it every day, like I see people Good job of doing. <laughs> They're superhuman. Um, you know, they're, the worst that I've seen is a sinus irritation and things, and obviously you should stop if you're feeling that. I can't speak to like super long term effects. I have never, um, I did actually quite a bit of research leading up to this, and there um, has not been very, like, hasn't been anything on record as it being cancer causing or anything. But once again, I think it's just very important to be smart, be mindful. Sheree, um, if it's okay, I'm going to open up to some questions. Yeah. For about yeah. 15 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm hoping I covered some stuff. I'm sure I missed some stuff. I hope I didn't bore anyone, but I'm going to take some questions. So, um, yeah, this is kind of two part. Um, are, one, are there any contraindications um, to working with Hepe? And two, uh, what uh, other plant medicines does it interact well with? I mean, I know it works well with Aya, but is it is it something you can uh, use with psilocybin, or, or is that? Um, as far as you said, contraindications, meaning like negative effects or in the body, like or certain, you know. Medications or certain things that that, uh, that you have in your body, or, or some sort of, you know, um, or I would always, I would always, I haven't really heard of, like again. Now we're talking about rape that's not psychoactive. This is this is this is yeah. tobacco snuff. Um, I would take the same precautions that you might if you were smoking in terms of like I, I don't advise it for people with heart problems, heart risk stroke and things like that. I think if you're on a medication, it's maybe, actually there's no maybe about it, you should consult a physician before using anything like, like it. It's just playing it safe. I don't, I don't have a pharm, uh, pharmaceutical background, so I couldn't tell you across the board about a particular medicine. I haven't really heard of anything in particular, so I would consult a physician. In terms of if it works, how it interacts with other plant medicines. If you're working with a facilitator, talk to the facilitator. My teacher in Peru does not allow Bape and Ayahuasca ceremonies. He believes it's it's almost like a, a, a distraction, and that if you know if you're not meant to have a purge, then it's fine. You know, it, it's another voice talking over another a teacher. Uh, you know. I don't have the experience with psilocybin to say, Greg, maybe you do. Yeah, it does. It does it work. It's nice with psilocybin. Um, with all this, even with, I think it's great with cannabis. It's very synergetic with other, other medicines. You know, psilocybin, LSD, and cannabis are just very well. Um, there are a lot of people who talk about not mixing plant medicines and all the time, but my experience is, yeah, it works very well. Thank you. They can help extend the journey no matter what it is. Probably the only thing I would be careful with is the tour around the toy. That's crazy stuff to begin with. So I don't know if I would have anything else than that. Yes. Um, question that kind of like just like an observation. I notice like in you know, since I've been doing it my home, I do it a meditation in the morning. 
and I was doing like just you know just one whichever one I was working on that week, and then I would go to the next one. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna try two different ones, like mm-hmm. one different one, one night. And I realized I did that, and some of them worked well together, and some was not good, like not a good experience. And I was, I was gonna ask you is that like something that is like common that some of even the rockies don't really go. Yeah, I don't say go, but like you know, not really. Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, we want to, I look at these as each one is a very unique personality. Yeah. And especially when we're talking about, you know, s- that they contain plant plant medicines in and of themselves. For instance, like, you may have a rape that has yarina, which is a flower mm-hmm. um, that's used for, it's a protection, energetic protection. That might not interact so well with, you know, some of the other flowers or plants of the, of the Amazon. It's in the same way that we don't. This is why it's actually a really interesting topic. It's why I always. It's why I advise people to try doing plant diets. Plant diet would be the traditional dieta would be, you know, iso, in isolation with a facilitator working with a particular plant for, you know, maybe three or four weeks at a time. Um, it may be combined with ceremonies, but the idea is to develop a relationship with that particular plant. That particular plant teaches you the songs. That t- particular plant shows itself to you, reveals itself to you. In, in doing dietas, you get to know the personalities of some of these plants. Some are really talkative. Some of them are very open. Some are not. Some are um, much more inviting and much more uh, motherly. Some are not. You know. So once again, you might get you might get the hint of that from what you're saying. If you were to do something more on an immersion and a dieta with a group plant, you would see that even on a, a grander scale and start to understand even more about what I'm talking about in terms of how we relate. What do you hope to achieve with it? And in that I can maybe point someone in the right direction. For someone like me who's worked in plant medicine quite a bit, I am awfully conservative in terms of how I prescribe because my first um, feeling is when I ask what is your intention is I want to try to help someone see if they have resources within that may be able to uh, achieve that or at least start them on that path because I think that the plant medicine is very helpful in getting someone there but I always want to make it very clear that it requires some work so I want to start off with putting that, planting that seed, saying like, you know, so it's not like we're expecting just like a jar of something that's gonna fix whatever. In terms of administration, um, you know, I don't recommend eating beforehand, especially if you're new, because even me, like I still get very nauseous. You know, to me, the administration is meant to clear out the sinuses, clear out the throat, clear out the stomach. It's gonna pull mucus and gross stuff out. And if you ate, you're gonna probably get sick if you're anything like me. Um, what you know, about water intake beforehand? You know, it's okay. Just know that you might throw up. You know, I mean, okay. you know, it's it's. Yeah. You can keep a little water with you. Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 it's generally said, you know, you start with a pea-sized amount and, you know, flatten it with the curry pan. Pea-sized amount, flatten it, scoop toward the heart is sort of the method. Half, left, and then right. Um, you always want to do both sides. It's a, it's a, balance, energetic balance thing. Is there any significance to doing the left first and then the right? 
Well, I guess you can turn it around. Only well, left is always, you know, for me, the receiving. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, I'm accustomed to doing it that way, too. Um, so you, you mentioned that it's, it's non psychoactive, but I was wondering if you could further elaborate on just like sensation, experience, feeling, like for like the total layman, like just mm-hmm. really kind of like what, what do you experience on the sort of physical plane and then. Any, any further you'd like to elaborate? Sure. Again, let's say um, let's say you're, that you are taking a fairly hefty dose, a powerful dose. Uh, you're going to feel some pressure and it's probably a bit of almost like stars discomfort. It's going to maybe feel like this shot the back of your head off. Um, yeah, especially if certain people that we know are administering it. Um, you may feel that this part of your, uh, you might want to call this a third eye area, or this part of your sinus and brain is going to feel expanded. You may feel, like this gentleman said, that the thoughts kind of cease. For me, everything kind of focuses here. You may feel some, um, it might be a little hard to breathe up here, so you want to breathe through the mouth for a little bit, and when you feel like you can, start the breathing normally through the nose so that this can kind of spread out. You may feel sensations all through your body. And this is where I, I think it's important to feel where those sensations are, where the discomfort is, because that's usually where the stuckness is. You might feel some sweats, You might feel some nausea. You... um, Burning. A little burning in the sinuses that usually goes away in a little bit. Um, Crying. A little tears. Throat. You might get a little of the dust in the throat, which Mm -hmm. isn't not that fun. (laughs) Waves of energy going through your body. You can get the burning in the brain. Mm -hmm. It's really different because, like, again, it kind of tends to know where to go Mm -hmm. so you might I've had it where it's like feeling all through my arms Mm -hmm. to the tips Mm -hmm. and I've had it you know it's like you just never quite know but in terms of the sensation you know and again I think because there's a little bit of that the actual nicotine experience there's going to be some of this like there's like a a little bit of maybe an increased heart rate increased blood flow the experience generally intense is probably intense for maybe again it can vary for people but usually after 10 minutes it's starting to kind of subside and when you do it it's not as if you're incapacitated really i mean i've done it and had a meditation and then my doorbell rang and it's not ideal but it's like you can still function Um, we're gonna get everybody, so sorry. Do you um, blow your nose before <coughs> breathing through the nose, or do you go ahead and breathe? No, in? I try to not blow my nose until I absolutely feel like I have to, until it's basically dripping. Um, you know, the medicine, you know, the medicine you want to kind of keep with you as much as you can. Yeah. I use Pape and Mike in practice too, mm-hmm. and I find that set and setting are really important. You know, as the Shuri brought up in your lecture last week or whatever it was, set and setting are really important. Mm-hmm. So if you just, you know, you're in your car, you're on your way somewhere, and you've got your Rabe with you, and you have a few minutes and you blow some up your nose, it's going to be a lot different than if you're at home with soft music a chance to calm down, get out of your mind, into your heart, mm-hmm. set an intention, and then take some rough day, meditate for 20 minutes. That will be an entirely different, probably much more positive experience. It's a really good mm-hmm. point, and, and I probably didn't emphasize that enough in this particular talk, but yes, um, take some time, take some, make it a ceremony. Um, so I work uh, a lot with SD as well, my personal work. Something you do if you're, if you're trying to write. Um, do you bring that into your personal work with this, or um, in other words, um, when you um, 
finish taking in the hobby, are you allowing yourself to move uh, intuitively um, through the somatics, or are you sitting very still and just and staying back? There? I think. I think that I use this when, when we talk about somatics, and this is maybe hopefully another. We're going to do a whole other talk maybe in the new year on somatic experiencing and really what it is. It's basically about feeling the sensations happening in your body and using that to pinpoint where there's something that needs attention, whether it be a stuck energy or whatever. I think for me, because Rapé is an amplifier of that and it's bringing things up to the surface, it might intensify a sensation that's there on a subtle level and allowing me to see the depth of what's happening in that stuckness. Um, do you move through it or are you an observer of it? My idea of moving through it is to is is very pretty much static unless I feel it's in, it's emotion that needs to be completed. Sometimes with trauma, especially that's a physical accident, the brain wants to complete emotion. And what's going to happen is a person's going to keep getting injured in that same spot until they complete the actual emotion. So it could just be putting you know you went to put your coffee cup on the glass table and your hand went through the glass table and you didn't get to complete that motion and then all of a sudden you know you cut that hand again and then all of a sudden over the years you hurt it hurt it hurt it because you're trying the brain is obsessed with wanting to complete something so this is a real nutshell version of somatic I know it's like oversimplification but I would generally um, my movement would be an energetic movement to try to maybe I'll hold a point there and, and, and give it some attention do you have something? Yeah, I know there's different hapes that, um, different variations that, that they have different uh, intensity. Mm -hmm. um, is there a certain blend or or a dip or a hape that increases the duration? Like one that lasts a longer yeah. time? Hmm. Um, I'd have to think about that. I don't. I mean, I think it might really depend on how your body, you know, keep in mind, you know, your body is also able to build resistance to these things. So, you know, a bigger dose might be the solution because I don't know if there's one that, that would provide, you know, a standard longer term effect for all people. There's certain ones that I've had that they, they have done that, you know, it's like, well, I really need to give myself 30 minutes for this because... I know this particular one, but I don't I haven't seen that that's always the case for different people. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen an allergic reaction? Yeah. Yeah. What form did it Uh sinus irritation. And I've also seen sinus irritation for two other things with raw pain, which is uh, if it's not ground fine enough. And if the balance of ashes to mapacho is off, meaning if there's too much uh, ashes. Um, yeah, I've seen quite a bit, but not from anything that's come from me. <laughs> <laughs> How would you handle that then? You just wait and let it clear? I wouldn't use that one anymore. Well, there's that. Yeah, yeah I would definitely, again, you know, first and foremost is you want to be kind to your body, so heal first, heal, especially if you have a, if there's any kind of sickness in the body, sometimes people feel like, oh, Rappé is going to help my cold, if you want to do that, that's cool, I, I feel that, you know, if you have an irritation in your sinus, um, you may want to just stay away from all that stuff, you know, for a little bit give it some time to heal. If you work with Rappé, you might notice that you might eventually, you know, I, I can't remember. What I'm trying to say is it will pull out toxins. And so I have seen it where, you know, somebody's working with Rappé and maybe they get a little bit of a, of a quick cold. It's, it's hard to say because I'm not a doctor, but sometimes the feeling I get is like, you know, it's kind of pulling some gunk out because usually it passes pretty quick. 
um, if you take like a, a, a large dose and you, it begins to travel down the back of your throat, you mentioned it's beneficial to hold on to the medicine as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend swallowing it? Or you can, it you can, uh, you can spit it out. I It'll mean, make you sick if you swallow. Uh, no, it's mm -hmm. fine. It's fine. It, it might make you purge because you're ingesting pure, you know, tobacco. Um, there's some traditions that that would say, yeah, you have to swallow. It. There's others that that say no. I'd say if you do swallow it, know that it, it may intensify that purgative effect. Um, I love that bit in ceremony, and then I always uh, the facilitator that I work with. It, there's a, a time <coughs> it's, and, and I use it for um, periods where I'm stuck. I found that very helpful. Um, I've never, and I've tried, but I've never been able to really get into the practice um, just on a daily basis. Uh, what are the advantages, the added advantages to working with it? Um, just to, you know. I think it really depends on. I mean, if I, I always say this with every plant medicine, I mean, if you if you feel if you feel complete, you know, if you don't feel. Um, like you need to, there's really no reason to partake. I think with Rape, everyone here that I've spoken to, who I know, has different reasons for uh, using it as part of their either daily, weekly, or whatever rituals. You know, one for for my purposes, it's learning the personalities and connecting to the actual plants themselves. For me, it's a form of dieta as I work with a particular rape for maybe 30 days at a time and start to get an energetic sense of what that plant is or what that plant is. For someone else, it could be that meditation is very challenging for them and they have a lot of mind chatter and that the rape offers a bit of grounding and some, some quietness of the mind, you know. So, you know, others say that, you know, if they're working with a, in a plant medicine regimen, maybe doing ceremonies every month or a few months, that having the access to the rapé allows them to kind of have a connection to the plant world um, without being in ceremony constantly. So there's a million other reasons that people may personally have I always like to look at Rapé as um, I see it as personal work um, that I'd like to see maybe um, getting to a point where people say, okay, I, I've achieved the thing that I've been uh, striving for, and now let's <coughs> see what, where am I at and take some time rather than just say, rather than doing it. Um, for as an end in itself, you know. Again, that's my philosophy on, on the work you know. Last question. Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the energy exchange that you were talking about. Um, so I do a lot of body work in Reiki, and I can understand that exchange that's happening. And I've also witnessed the facilitators in my community. Um, you know, they're giving us different different types of, of supplements, um, and 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 seeing how they feel throughout the evening and working with a bunch of different people. Um, and I'm guessing that I, I don't know this. I'm guessing that you've um, worked with other medicines where you've given it to people, or no? Okay. So is that exchange of energy with 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 uh, with uh, hot bay? Because you're actually blowing it into somebody versus pouring them a tea or giving them a supplement. Is it the same kind of a thing or is it more intense because you're actually boom it's like it's like this fast? I don't know I can't say if it's more intense because obviously, you know serving plant medicines of any kind require the person you're serving to have a relationship that um, makes them prepared for any situation and 
any kind of um, energetic thing that's happening and an intuition that comes along with it. I think breath is an incredibly intimate exchange. So I think that there are similarities, um, but I think it's very different. So I don't know if it totally answers the question, but I think breath counts for a really big part of that. In, in you know shamanic healing, breath is a huge part of it to begin with because we're we're blowing mapacho, we're blowing the soplata, we're blowing you know I might swig Florida water and then spray that. Um, whenever you know the essence of the person who's doing the healing is expressed onto someone else, you're not only working with the power of the medicine or the water or the whatever, you're also uh, imbuing it with some intention as well. So that the, you know, that's where the importance of it comes in with the rapé. You know, someone who is not very clear or has some stuff in themselves or, or maybe doesn't have the protection that is willing to uh, shield them from what might come back mm -hmm. is going to be important. So, you know, I, I don't know if it answers your question or if it just, or if I just kind of was convoluting it, but hopefully I'm really clear. Yeah. I think that we have to, I'm going to, I think we have to wrap because we have a time frame on this room. Um, Shri is going to give some closing.